As we're opening the doors one more time for everyone, I want to welcome one more time all of you joining today um, a, a, another IPOSC-led webinar, this time with, with our fantastic colleagues um, and um, from, from the Philippine Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. Again, this webinar is co-organized by um, and with, with the Philippine Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. Um, we have a phenomenal agenda as you're, as you're seeing. And um, it, is, it is again, our pleasure. And, and um, as always, uh, this webinar is or, uh, hosted by the American Academy of Ophthalmology technical team. And I would like to thank as always, Dan and, and Michael for all the hard work they're doing. Um, also, um, not only the, the, the Philippine Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology um, and Strabismus Friends, uh, but as always, Jason Yam, um, Sonal Parzavandi, and Satya Gagulian, for all the help that that you you um, to do that you do to put the the webinar together. And without further ado, I just want to do a quick update, as we always do. As you remember, that IPOSC is a 90 member society, um, really overseeing more than 20,000 individuals, and and it's been growing and the board of directors and we will be having a, a, a change in flag um, soon enough in July. And um, again, I wanna acknowledge all the phenomenal work that the advisory board has been doing. And um, as you all know, there are many committees under the IPOSC very active and, and as you can see, training and education committee is leading the way in, in, in all aspects. Um, maybe one, uh, our, uh, update is, is in order from the ROP committee. I want to particularly focus on the SIBA, the SIBA committee, um, the Stop Infant Blindness in Africa committee. As you all know, we have established three centers of focus. And uh, now as of May, beginning of the way, uh, May, Rwanda and Uganda training team um, actually did visit, which uh, is compiled of ophthalmologist, neonatologist and NICU nurse their initial visits and they were extremely successful. They even got uh, TV coverage in, in, their, in, 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 um, in, the, in the local um, um, country and their efforts were again, well received throughout. A Nigeria visit is coming up in June and uh, phase two with, with now nine more centers ident identified across the Africa, which uh, we're gearing towards that. So again, thank you for all the SIBA committee for doing all the things that they're doing. Again, the training committee, and we will, we're continuing and we'll uh, continue to do the, the webinars as before. Um, as always, stay tuned. Uh, we are in the transition on, on a new website and um, you'll hear more about that. And uh, we will have a IPOS council meeting coming up for the, for the representatives. Um, so that's that. Uh, without further ado, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank the moderators, um, uh, the, the um, Jan de Faber, um, initially from Rotterdam, Netherlands. He is the vice president of IPOSC and the past president of European Society of Ophthalmology. Um, he was delighted to have trained four excellent fellows from Philippine and Rotterdam. And, and also um, our uh, dear colleague, Roland uh, Joseph Tan. Um, he is an officer in Philippine Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. He's a clinical associate professor in Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences in Philippine General Hospital, University of Philippines in Manila. And, and he's a medical specialist in, in General Hospital and the Medical Center in Baguio City, Philippines. And he has done his fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology and, and strabismus at Stein Eye Institute in, in USA, and another fellowship in oculoplastics in orbit, University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. He is a proud husband to Christine and father to Matteo and Samuel. So hi to Matt, Matteo and Samuel. And with, with that, I would like to hand it over to my dear friend, uh, Roland. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you very much, Farouk. So good evening, everyone. Uh, Good evening from the Philippines. Magandang gabi sa inyong lahat. Uh, we'd like to thank the International Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Council and the American Academy of Ophthalmology for inviting and letting our society co-host this event. Just a short introduction of our society. We are the Philippine Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, which was established in November 1998 with Dr. Evelyn Cortez as our first president. 
Currently, we are the officers of the society headed by our president, Dr. Emmanuel Carlos Chua. To date, oh, we have 53 active members serving the different areas of the Philippines. The society has organized several projects to promote and increase awareness on pediatric eye care, fora on childhood blindness, and lectures on relevant topics were conducted. Policy statements together with other specialty organizations were also made, such as the Retinopathy of Prematurity Screening Guidelines. We are also very active with our online social media campaigns. Here are some examples uh, for screen time, digital eye strain. Uh, we also have uh, uh, campaigns for measles, myopia, pediatric cataract, and of course, retinoblastoma. And in 2019, our society launched our CLARO, which translates to clear in English, campaign to encourage children to play outdoors to decrease the progression of myopia. Now that we are returning to the new normal, we are hoping to get this project up and running again soon. So thank you very much. And um, I just want to add one more thing. Um, um, for all the uh, members that are again joining us, um, please remember to uh, ask your questions throughout the webinar in the, uh, in the uh, Q&A pod on the, on the bottom as well as, um, as you've noticed, there is an interpretation in the bottom, um, just like the previous webinar, uh, our Russian speaking uh, colleagues will be benefiting um, all, all the hard work from Max. Um, actually, we do invite um, other societies if they're interested and if they can um, provide a simultaneous interpreter, please contact us and we are more than ha happy to accommodate that in our webinars. Um, thank you again. So thank you, Farouk. So uh, again, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar titled Retinoblastoma Now and the Future. We have five speakers tonight. The open forum will be at the end of the five presentations. However, you can already type in your questions in the Q&A box, as Farouk said, uh, while the presentations are ongoing. By doing so, the speakers can already answer your questions through the Q&A box as well, uh, or they can opt to answer your question live later. We now proceed to our first speaker, Dr. Gary Jan Mercado from the Philippines, who will be talking on the Philippine retinoblastoma situation, barriers, and strategies. Good day, everyone. Thank you for giving me the privilege to participate in this series of talks on retinoblastoma. I'm eager to learn from my mentor, Dr. Carol Shields, and to learn from our inspiring young ocular oncologist. It's also an honor to be with Dr. Barnoya and learn about the strategies that they have done in Guatemala. I have no financial disclosures for this talk, nor for my practice in the care of retinoblastoma. To start, allow me to brief you about the Philippines and our healthcare system. The Philippines is an archipelago composed of 7,641 islands divided in three main island groups, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Majority of these island communities still access the main islands via ferry boats. As of September 2020, we have a population of 110 million with a rapid population growth rate. A third of this population is in the national capital region in the island of Luzon. We have about 1,258 hospitals in the country, of which 34% are government funded and 66% are privately owned. Healthcare expenditures measured in 2016 showed that 63% came from private expenditures while only 36% came, came from the government. At present, most health-related expenses are paid out of pocket. As for Philippine eye care, there are 1,762 ophthalmologists in the country, 58% of whom practice in the national capital region. The ophthalmologists range from general ophthalmologists to highly specialized ophthalmic practitioners. Most work in the private services, while others have a share of private, public, and academic work. To date, there are five ocular oncologists in the Philippines. All of us practice in the national capital region and nearby provinces. 
we have at least four subspecialists with retinoblastoma training, three of whom practice in the national uh, capital region as well. Allow me now to introduce my academic aff affiliation from which the data I will present are derived from. The University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital is a university-based, state-funded tertiary facility. This means that we are a national referral with a patient base that is composed generally of financially challenged patients who come from different regions of the Philippines. It is here that we have the first ocular oncology service in the country. Philippine retinoblastoma care was started in our institution by the late uh, Romeo B. Espiritu. Dr. Espiritu was a vitreo retinal surgeon who started focus treatment on ret of retinoblastoma at the Philippine General Hospital on or about 1967. Earlier reports on the epidemiology of Philippine retinoblastoma are derived from his work. In 1998, Dr. Enrico Domingo, Enrique Domingo and myself formed the Ocular Oncology and Pathology Service and introduced globe sparing management. And in, nine, in, and in 2021, the service became a separate ophthalmic division, the Division of Ocular Oncology and Retinoblastoma. We were joined by Dr. Pamela Estudillo, a pediatric ophthalmologist with special training in retinoblastoma care. The University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital is also the home of the National Institutes of Health, of which the Cancer Institute and the Philippine Eye Research Institute are part of. The Philippine Eye Research Institute has the only fully dedicated ocular pathology laboratory in the country. From the Ocular Pathology Laboratory, Domingo et al. made a 10-year review of 1,551 histologically confirmed eye and ocular adnexal tumors. The breakdown showed that 394 were intraocular malignant tumors. Retinoblastoma accounted for 90.9% .9 of all intraocular cancers. In our series of reviews of the PGH experience from 1967 to 2008, we reported a five-fold increase of detection and care of cases from 40 per 100,000 eye cases to 237 per 100,000 new cases from 1967 to 2004. Although there was a decreasing incidence, gross extraocular disease is still a significant burden. Likewise, detection of intraocular RB are still predominantly in the advanced intraocular stages of groups D and E. In the review of Noguera, 100% of unilateral cases were either group D or higher, while bilateral retinoblastoma cases, 69% of eyes were group, were group D or worse. Our current unpublished review continued to show similar rates of a late intraocular presentation. This highlights the persistent concern of delayed consultation and referral, resulting in advanced disease presentation for our specific population base. With bilateral retinoblastoma, we have increasing successes in globe salvage of better eyes because of access to chemotherapy and globe sparing modalities, which include TTT, cryotherapy, systemic and intravitreal chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. Our center's initial attempt at intraarterial chemotherapy failed due to technical difficulties, but we are encouraged by the first successfully performed IAC in the country at the St. Luke's Medical Center by Dr. Andre Martin's team. We look forward to utilizing this technology, especially for our bi advanced bilateral cases. Despite the advances in technologies for globe salvage and its growing availability in the Philippines, our use of these technologies is limited because of the persistent late presentation of our patients. Barriers to healthcare access is the main stumbling block. Our geographic predicament, being an archipelago, creates a major challenge for accessing healthcare. Financial costs is the most common reason given for the delay. Cost may be in the form of actual medical expense, but may also be just simply the cost of transportation to a healthcare facility and the loss of income revenue from the displacement. The lack of government support for health services creates inequalities in access to health care and public health information. Analyzing these barriers, we are considering possible strategies for the National Retinoblastoma Care Program for the Philippines. This includes empowerment of IMDs, creation of tiered retinoblastoma care centers, 
and improve pathway, retinoblastoma pathways in information programs. Understanding the limited number of RB experts empowering regional non-specialized IMDs to be part of the care may be a solution. We are in the process of creating a clinical practice guideline for retinoblastoma that will hopefully create a standard for retinoblastoma care. It may serve as a guide and a resource. Importantly, the CPG will be made to address the concerns of the low middle income country and be tailored fitted to tailor fitted for the Philippine situation while incorporating when appropriate the treatment advances of more developed countries. In addition, we hope to have a Philippine retinoblastoma network composed of a multidisciplinary team who may give constant guidance and supervision through telemedicine. This will allow us to utilize the know-how of a few to serve the many. A tiered care program is envisioned that will provide different levels of care. This is to rationalize the use of limited resources and yet provide optimal care. Initial ancillary diagnostic examinations and treatments like life-saving and nucleation may be for performed in lower tiered care centers under the supervision of the proposed multidisciplinary RB care team. Highly specialized globe and vision sparing techniques, if and when appropriate, should still be performed in the highest level tiered retinoblastoma treatment center. Such, treat, such tiered program hopefully will encourage more information dissemination, easier access for patients, and lay the groundwork for a referral pathway for retinoblastoma. As part of telemedicine and through programs coordinated by the Philippine Retinoblastoma Network, information and awareness programs may be conducted. The referral, the referral pathway and assistance program should be put in place so that from detection, the patients will be guided to where they can be diagnosed and cared for appropriately. In summary, we presented the status of retinoblastoma care in the Philippines through data from a tertiary state-funded university-based national referral institution. We also presented the complex healthcare system, geographic and socioeconomic barriers in the Philippines that continue to challenge our goal of providing appropriate care for our retinoblastoma patients. We stress the persistent challenge of delayed consultation and consequently advanced disease stage presentation. We presented our proposed strategies in overcoming these barriers, and we hope that this will eventually provide a rational, holistic, and achievable approach in the care of the Filipino child with retinoblastoma. Thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much for the lecture, Dr. Mercado. Again, if you have questions for Dr. Mercado, you can type them in the Q&A box. We now move to our second speaker, Dr. Hanilen Mariel Teo from the Philippines, who will be talking on managing retinoblastoma cases in a developing country, perils and pitfalls. The first patient is a one-month-old premature infant born with neonatal sepsis and pathologic jaundice. She was referred for a white macular mass post ROP screening. In-clinic examination with IO and B scan revealed grade B retinoblastoma in the left eye. MRI showed no brain lesion. At two months old, she was treated for sepsis and cleared for EUA, which showed an enlarging base and height of the tumor. Focal laser was performed, but only one agent chemotherapy was given due to persistent jaundice of undetermined cause. Regular EUA was performed for close monitoring and treatment. In a 10 months old, she received three therapies of focal laser and three cycles each of one agent chemotherapy for when she had persistent jaundice and three agent chemotherapy when the jaundice resolved. The rhinoblastoma in the left eye was treated. There are no new lesions and no suspicious growth. The right eye remains normal. The second patient presented with leukocoria in the right eye at four months old and was initially misdiagnosed with glaucoma. At nine months old, the second ophthalmologist advised B-scan. Unfortunately, they were lost to follow-up due to funding issues. 
At one year and six months old, he was brought to our institution for bulging of the right eye. B scan showed calcified intraocular mass in both the right and the left eye. He was immediately referred to a pediatric hematology oncology team in our institution and a radiation oncology team in a private institution with a memorandum of agreement with their government institution for cost subsidy. Clinical and pathologic diagnosis was retinoblastoma in both eyes, at least IRSS3B in the right eye and grade E in the left eye post bilateral inoculation. MRI showed no brain lesion. Despite the early referral, there was incomplete systemic workup, no staging of retinoblastoma, and no chemotherapy was given. The RBC and the platelet count continued to decrease until such point that the patient was deemed unfit to receive chemotherapy. The patient continued to deteriorate systemically and eventually required oxygen support. The parents decided to bring home the patients against medical advice. What is the difference between the two patients? Hi, I'm Honey Lenteo, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk about managing retinoblastoma in the developing country, pearls and pitfalls. I have no financial disclosure. What is the difference between the two patients? Patient number one is more commonly seen in the developed high-income countries and in some designated RB referral centers in developing countries while patient number two is more commonly seen in developing low and middle income countries. The Philippines is in Southeast Asia and is composed of more than 7,000 islands and three main islands, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Using the gross national income or the GNI per capita, which estimates a country's overall standard of living, the World Bank considers the Philippines a lower middle income country. In general, low income and middle income countries are categorized categorized as developing countries by the United Nations, which uses the Human Development Index as a way to classify countries as being developed country in transition or a developing country. The Philippines, together with most countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, is considered a developing country by the United Nations. These are the factors used to compute the HDI in health or under health, infant mortality rate is one parameter to actually distinguish developed and developing countries. Some health advocates are actually trying to use or suggest rhinoblastoma mortality rate as a way to distinguish developing and developed countries. Up to 85% of retinoblastoma is seen in developing countries. 43% of retinoblastoma is seen in the Asia Pacific, and these are the six countries with the highest retinoblastoma cases in the Asia Pacific. India has the highest absolute number of retinoblastoma cases in the Asia Pacific. However, the Philippines actually has a higher number of cases per million population. In the Philippines, retinoblastoma is the most common intraocular malignancy in childhood and in the overall population. The expected retinoblastoma cases per year is 200 children between ages 0 to 4 years old. In 2017, a tertiary RB referral center in Manila saw 142 treatment-naive retinoblastoma cases. Here are some generalizations on retinoblastoma in a developing country, including the Philippines, in contrast to those in a developed countries. Those in a developing country are diagnosed at an older age, at 30 months versus 14 months in a developed country. They have more advanced stage and presentation, group E and extraocular. In fact, in the Philippines, 65 to 90 percent of them are advanced in stage. And because of this, aside from leukocoria, they actually present more commonly with orbital mass as well as with thalamus. They have a delayed diagnosis with a higher risk of metastasis, up to 19% in developing countries versus less than 1% in developed countries. The cost of delayed diagnosis of retinoblastoma in the Philippines is primarily financial costs. Despite this, 11% is still misdiagnosed. Despite having more than 1,500 ophthalmologists across the nation, this is a comparison of two hospitals, hospital number one, wherein patient number one presented a while ago was seen, 
located in Manila and hospital number two were in patient number two presented a while ago outside of Manila. Both hospitals are actually comparable in terms of several parameters, including the age of onset of symptoms, the age of diagnosis, and the delay between the onset and the diagnosis, as well as the laterality of retinoblastoma and the family history. These are comparable not only between the two hospitals, but also against international publications. Both hospitals also have majority, or most of them actually have extraocular retinoblastoma, if not all of them. Despite this similarity, they are different in terms of the outcome, with a relatively more successful outcome for the first hospital as opposed to the second hospital. And this can be attributed to a stronger retinoblastoma team in the first hospital, as well as the presence of pediatric oncologists who is trained in the treatment of retinoblastoma. Unfortunately, despite the presence of pediatric hematology oncology team in the second hospital, the result is quite disheartening having abandonment, patients being brought home against medical advice, and mortality that are not related or not directly related to retinoblastoma. So we actually need more work in terms of improving the outcome in the second hospital. The presence of trained pediatric oncologists as well as radiation oncologists in the treatment of retinoblastoma uh, in developing countries such as the Philippines could not be emphasized enough because we are seeing advanced stages of retinoblastoma. In the Philippines, there are only a little over 50 number of pediatric oncologists and there are only a little over 150 radiation oncologists across the country. It is thus very important to create a multidisciplinary team within the same hospital in terms of having a tailored targeted therapy. We can only hope that there would be an even distribution of specialists geographically nationwide. If not, then we will need to create a strong RB referral network so that we can have early detection and diagnosis, also through a national public awareness campaign, together with the help of local healthcare workers and medical professionals such as pediatricians and ophthalmologists. We need to create a retinoblastoma database, not only in terms of knowing the outcome of our management, but also in establishing policies that may improve the national health insurance coverage. Of course, we always welcome increased government funding to improve infrastructure and technology. And of course, support groups, hiring patient navigators to make sure that we don't have any dropouts in terms of treatment. All for the ultimate goal of increasing the survival, saving the eye, and hopefully save the vision, finally, um, just as our counterparts in developed countries are doing. In conclusion, Retinoblastoma remains an important malignancy affecting those in developing countries. Several problems inherent in developing countries need to be addressed to improve the outcome of managing retinoblastoma. These are my references. I am grateful for the following people, organizations, and societies for making this talk possible. To my retinoblastoma team in various institutions, and to Dr. Hakan Demirchi for continually being an inspiration. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much for that comprehensive lecture, Dr. Teo. Again, if you have questions for Dr. Teo, you can type them in the Q&A box. Our third speaker is Dr. Andre Martin from the Philippines, and he will talk about updates on retinoblastoma treatment and their complications in the Philippines. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Andre Martin, and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to give this lecture about the Philippine RB treatment updates. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, this is Jose Rizal. Uh, he's a Philippine. He is the Philippine national hero. He, is, uh, he was in the forefront of the revolution, eventually leading to the independence of the Philippines. What is uh, interesting about Dr. Jose Rizal, or Jose Rizal is he is a doctor and, and an ophthalmologist at that. If you look at the top right photo, that is a painting of him uh, doing cataract surgery on his mother. And uh, just like 
all of ophthalmology, it is technology driven. And um, during this time, cataract surgery was done by couching, dislodging the lens, pushing it back to the vitreous cavity, if I'm not mistaken. And just like the history of RB treatment, we started off doing enucleation all the way up to this year, 2022. And all these treatments, all these discoveries are still being done. Uh, in the Philippines, we all we have all of these already, except one, um, plaque brachytherapy. And the one that I will be discussing later just came to our shores this year. So chemotherapy, let's talk about intravenous chemotherapy. It was done in the early 90s, and it dislodged uh, RT being the mainstay first-line treatment for retinoblastoma. So here, we use the VEC regimen. Uh, we use a once a month for six months, and I think that's a routine, or that's what is being used around the world too. Uh, we used it to reduce the tumor, chemo reduction, so we can do other therapies like cryotherapy and TTT. Systemic uh, intravenous chemotherapy is very successful, uh, successful, especially in groups A, B, and C. Um, uh, evidence here is the globe salvage rates, more than 90% for those groups, and it grows uh, smaller, it decreases at group D and E, and that is why we need to detect RB early, uh, especially in uh, the Philippines where um, we see RBs in the clinic that it's already orbital, it's already proptotic. Intravitreal chemotherapy then uh, in the mid-2000s, it's mainly for the vitreous seeds, the diffuse vitreous seeds. It's used in combination with uh, intravenous and, and the IAC. So focal therapies that are available here in our country, in the Philippines, we can we use TTT, which is heat, or cryotherapy, which is a cold probe. And we use cryotherapy uh, for smaller tumors, for subretinal seeds less than three millimeters, and we do it with the guidance of an indirect ophthalmoscope. Much like what we do with TTT, uh, we use it also with the uh, indirect ophthalmoscope, and we wait for that grayish discoloration, the response of uh, what we uh, do the laser to. EBRT. Um, we also do this, especially for positive margins, post-enucleation positive margins, and those with uh, pathologic high-risk features, such as uh, choroidal invasion, scleral invasion, optic nerve invasion. And what we want to shy away from because of the EBRT uh, side effects is that it has a propensity to give secondary cancers later on in life. And during my training, uh, I've seen uh, RB survivors reach their 20s and 30s before the advent of chemotherapy that uh, radiation caused their sarcomas uh, around the orbit. Enucleation is uh, reserved for group D and E in developed countries, but here in the Philippines, we offer it even earlier groups, earlier stages. Why? Because uh, it is very difficult to gauge the follow-up of our patients. Uh, ophthalmo ophthalmologists are mostly located in the cities. RB patients or, uh, can be located anywhere. And if they're located in the far-flung areas, it's really difficult to gauge if they will follow up. And most of the treatments that I've mentioned are out of pocket. And the uh, majority or even more, more than majority, cannot even afford these kinds of treatments. For enucleation, since priority is saving the life of patient, we offer it even for earlier groups. So earlier this intra-arterial chemotherapy, it's very exciting times in the Philippines because this has already been done in our country. And I would like to uh, thank my mentors for exposing me to this kind of treatment. So it, you, before it was done in unilateral tumors, but right now it's also being done for bilateral tumors. It can be used for recurrent treatment failure and, as I said, bilateral retinoblastomas. So it's very effective for subretinal seeds. It decreases the main tumor, the size of the main tumor. It's not for everyone, though, because the smaller babies, uh, the caliber of their vessels, the microcatheter tips can't really fit in their blood vessels. So in my experience um, here, we used Melphalan. I think it's the exact uh, brand that we used. And uh, we did it with a pediatric interventional radiologist who was very good, who was excellent. Uh, this is a picture from a textbook, uh, Dr. Shields. This is Dr. Jabour, the IAC expert. 
over at Thomas Jefferson University. And this is just a sample cerebral angiogram depicting the ophthalmic artery as a first branch of the uh, internal carotid artery. And the lower right photo just shows the different branches of the vessels uh, going to the eye. And this is a video of what we did. This is a cerebral angiogram of the, our actual patient. And what is of note is that the ophthalmic artery isn't a branch of the internal carotid artery. And that's why we had to take a detour to the external carotid, to the maxillary, to the middle meningeal artery, and that's where the ophthalmic artery uh, arose from. If you can see, there's a faint circle to the left of your screen, and that's the outline of the eye, which the phenomenon in the parlance of the interventional radiologist is called choroidal blush, and that's it. And just another photo, it is zoomed in, focused on the eye, that uh, where the microcatheter tip was already advanced via ophthalmic artery. So the background photos are of our patient, and the insert is the ophthalmic artery arising from the internal carotid artery, which was not seen in our case. So just some other photos um, focusing on the ophthalmic artery. And uh, we did this successfully for the first IAC, and during the second and the third, since we already had a roadmap going to the ophthalmic artery, we uh, did the second and third cycles in a much less time. Okay, just some photo, photos of me and the team during the first IAC in the Philippines. So IAC, very successful up to group D, but come to group E, the ocular salv salvage rate plummets. Huh? So from 92%, from grade uh, group A, B, C, and D. In group E, it plummets to 36. That's why it's very important in uh, everyone all around the world to catch RB early. But if we combine intraarterial chemotherapy with intravitreal chemotherapy in group E, globe salvage increases from 36% to 73%. And that is quite a leap. So here are some before and after photos again. Before on the left, after on the right, IAC is very successful in reducing the size of the tumor and causing RB regression. Again, left is uh, before IAC, right is after IAC. You can see calcification and tumor regression on the right. Uh, IAC is very successful, although it has its own side effects like uh, other photos on the right showing choroidal ischemia and retinal ischemia. So the side effects of IAC as documented in a lot of publications, vascular occlusions, the common periorbital edema, madrosis and ptosis, and vitreous hemorrhage. Some even ask about the radiation exposure since when doing IAC, it's fluoroscopically guided, so it's under radiation. Uh, most of the time, that's why we, were, we wear the lead gowns, um, is cataract uh, risk, uh, I think. In some papers, cataract is a side effect, but not, it's not as common as the other ones. And the, is the frequent exposure to radiation a carcinogen? So we will find out. Huh? So in our experience in intra-arterial chemotherapy, our patients made tumor decrease in size. I was very happy to see that the vitreous seeds uh, decreased, almost disappeared after the third cycle, and there were no new tumors that were found. But uh, my question to the group is, uh, my patient or other uh, patient had cataract. It was a hypermature intumescent cataract after the first cycle of chemotherapy. So has anyone experienced uh, having a patient that had undergone IAC and developed cataract, a white one at that? I just want to note that this patient that I'm talking about uh, underwent EBRT on the contralateral eye for a post enucleation positive margin. So that might have uh, contributed to the cataract too. So since uh, we are new uh, in, the, in the Philippines IAC, we'll have to document uh, our experience and let's just find out. Um, just continue learning about it. Uh, have a great day ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, <clears throat> Dr. Andre Martin. Uh, this will bring us to the uh, uh, fourth uh, speaker, uh, and uh, she is uh, Margarita Barnoya from uh, Guatemala, and she will speak uh, about the retinoblastoma program in Guatemala. Margarita, please go ahead. Good morning. 
Uh, first, I want to thank the International Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Council, as well as the Philippine Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus and the AAO for inviting me to give this talk about our great retinoblastoma program in Guatemala City, Guatemala. Um, Myself, which I'm a pediatric ophthalmology instructor business and Dr. Amanda Lejos are in charge of this program. So Guatemala is located in Central America. Our actual population is 18 million uh, people. We have 24 Mayan languages, which makes our indigenous population very big, very intense and very different which sometimes can be a challenge in terms of managing the diagnosis and the treatment for this very important uh, tumor in our country. So uh, this was, uh, the statistics are from back in 12, uh, 2012, but it has mainly remained about the same numbers. Uh, most of our cases are unilateral. We diagnose around one to two new cases per week, and retinoblastoma is a third cause for childhood cancer in Guatemala, uh, followed, or, or the first cause is leukemia and uh, lymphomas. So in 2001, I met Dr. Joan O'Brien at UCSF, and I began to do some small rotations with her. And she introduced me to this marvelous clinic she has at UCSF in which she treats, uh, diagnoses and treats retinoblastoma. That's the first time I saw all her great equipment and her great capacities. And um, then I returned back to Guatemala and I brought this great idea about having ourselves, this equipment in this unit in Guatemala. What first struck me was the beautiful retcam she had and all the lasers and equipment. And of course, all the uh, uh, oncology team, which is so important in terms of treating and diagnosing this, um, this diagnosis or this disease in kids. So in 2003, uh, Dr. Jean Helveston, uh, which is known by all of you, uh, founder of uh, CyberSight and Orbis Telemedicine program came to Guatemala at uh, Rodolfo Robles Hospital. I was, um, I was actually ending my pediatric ophthalmology and uh, strip business residency. So we had a great conversation with him in terms that we needed all this equipment and uh, he began helping us in terms of getting this equipment for our country. So in 2004, this became a reality and uh, Orbis donated a RECOM2 a laser equipment, a cryotherapy unit, as well as an ultrasound unit with the help and uh, program in partnership with St. Jude. And this equipment is uh, now located at UNOP, which means Unidad Nacional de Oncología Pediatrica, which is the pediatric oncology union, unit in Guatemala, in which all childhood cancer is treated. So in 2004, we began doing this partnership. I began sending all the cases for review in, um, in St. Jude. It was first um, uh, reviewed by Dr. Bart Hike and then by Matt Wilson, who is one of my great teachers and mentors as well. So Matt came down to Guatemala in April 2005 to begin our great red, uh, brachytherapy uh, program. He uh, taught us and manually did all the seeding placement and gluing in uh, three gold plaques with, that actually are here in Guatemala of different diameters and different distribution. And we did our first three patients in April 2005. That's Matt and me in the in CAN, which is the National Institute, Cancerology Institute in Guatemala. And uh, the picture on the bottom is me at Customs it was around 1 a.m. in the in Guatemala airport because we had so much trouble trying to get the iodine 125 seats out from the airport because people wouldn't understand what that was for. So 
we had to come there and personally explain each and every one what, 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 what that was for. So we did went to surgery that same day. So we went out of the OR really, really early in the morning. These, uh, this was our, I think it was our, the last retinoblastoma placement, uh, plaque placement. It was March, 2003, and it was done in a Mexican patient. Uh, this, this was a successful plaque, and this is the great team, anesthesiologists and nurses that we have at INCAN, which is the National Institute of Cancer, um, that usually follows with us, the patients, because they need to be uh, in, in hospitalized with them for during the treatment. So this is our brachytherapy statistics. Uh, from 2005 to 2012, we did 13 patients. Seven of them were, are from Guatemala, one from El Salvador, one from Honduras, and four Mexican patients. On your right is the actual list. And we placed uh, four more plaques, five more plaques from 2003 to, two, to 2020. Um, you can see this blue arrows on your right which means that we used the same plaque for two patients. Um, which we did is that we irradiated for 90 hours, the first patient, and then the second one we calculated with Dr. Miguel Angel Ortega, which is the radiotherapist that has always um, uh, up, have, how do you say, um, helped us in this program. So he calculated with the technicians how much more radiotherapy uh, will the second patient need to have. So in March 2013 and July 2013, we used the same plaque for two patients, having uh, good results for uh, both of them. Here we go. That's March 2013 and July 2013. The last plaque was placed in a patient with a melanoma an adult patient, but we did not have good results with that. We need uh, we, that that eye ended up uh, in in enucleation. Uh, so this is more or less the exams under anesthesia we we did back then in 2012. These numbers have risen uh, tremendously. So we became a referral center for Central America, Mexico, and Panama. We also did this early detection campaign, which is awareness campaigns and talks with nurses, midwives, medical students, as well as pediatricians, so they can become the first contact in case they see any of these tumors or any of these white reflexes in kids, so they can refer them immediately to the National Oncology Unit. So treatments from 2013 to 2017 were done by Amanda Alejos. Uh, I left this program in 12, uh, 2012. So she's been doing diode, laser, cryotherapy, systemic chemotherapy, and nucleation, which is mainly what all of them, what, what most of us do in the world to treat retinoblastoma. We have two uh, great cases in the upper level before and after laser and lower level before and after laser. These are Amanda's uh, cases, successful cases. In 2018, she started intravitreal melphalan, which great results in some patients. And you can see this uh, pictures on your left, vitreous, abundant vitreous seedings, and picture on your right, uh, a great response to intravitreal melphalan. Of course, we do still have terrible outcomes, terrible 5B or end-stage retinolestomas with metastatic disease. Like I said at the beginning, we have this cultural and very intense um, mindful parents that do not bring their kids early or when they hear about the treatment, they do not want it. So they bring their kids back when they have advanced stage disease, as the pictures you're seeing here. We're still doing systemic chemo and nucleation as the first 
uh, treatment for unilateral cases. In this case, when you can see in a corneal ulcer in the picture on the right. So this is basically what the unit looks like. On your left is when I was there back then in 12, uh, 2012. We have a great equipment of nurses, anesthesiologists, and um, pediatric oncologists, psychology department also, which is now in charge of telling the parents the, the diagnosis and the necessary treatment. Because of, uh, as ophthalmologists, both Amanda and me have concluded that it's a real challenge to tell parents how to deal with this. Since we're not oncologists, uh, I'm an astrobiologist and she's a retina specialist, it's really, really challenging to tell parents about the diagnosis and treatment. So you can see Amanda here on your right doing with her new equipment, which is absolutely great, doing all the treatment. And me on the left in 2000, back in 2012. So this is uh, one of my greatest and favorite pictures. This is uh, before and after pictures. Uh, this is the first patient we did the plaque brachytherapy. Uh, left is, I believe that was 2012 and the right is three or four years later. Uh, same uh, patient at the bottom. And you're gonna see this patient on the top in the next few um, images. So this is him. On your left. He is now working on a call center. He's driving. He was a bilateral 5B retinal blastoma. And I almost went into, um, how do you say, I fought with, with my, with the pediatric ophthalmology um, team back in Rodolfo Robles because he wanted to do a bilateral nucleation. And I said, no, let's give him chemo. And he had 14 chemotherapy cycles. And then the patient on the other extreme right is a patient who is now graduating from high school this year. He had a unilateral enucleation and he wants to be a lawyer. They came recently to my clinic. So in conclusion, I believe we have a great and successful management in retinal blastoma with all our limitations being a third world uh, country. We administer chemotherapy, EBRT, enucleation, laser, and cryotherapy, depending on the diagnosis and the staging of the disease. We also do iodine-125 brachytherapy, intravenous melphalan, and this is Dr. Silvia Rivas on the bottom with me, which is in, she's in charge of palliative care, which is also very, very uh, important for the treatment of this very challenging diagnosis. And uh, last but not least, I want to thank my dearest friend and greatest supporter, Dr. Jean Helveston, who has always taught me to keep your chin up. And he has been a blessing in my life and to Guatemala to develop this great retinoblastoma treatment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Margarita. That was uh, an impressive report from uh, uh, your home country, Guatemala. Uh, uh, which uh, showed that actually with, uh, with uh, uh, sometimes you have to row with the oars uh, uh, you got and uh, you did an excellent job. That brings me to our uh, special guest, um, the queen of ocular tumors, Carol Shields. From uh, uh, she's the chief of uh, ocular oncology service at Will's uh, Eye Hospital in, uh, in in Philadelphia, and also professor of ophthalmology at Thomas's, uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, University. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, uh, <clears throat> Carol and Jerry are uh, the most uh, famous. Uh, a couple in uh, in uh, modern ophthalmology. Uh, uh, together, they have authored and co-authored eleven textbooks, three hundred and thirty-five chapters in edited uh, textbooks, more than eighteen hundred articles in major peer-reviewed uh, journals, and given over uh, eight hundred and sixty uh, lectureships. And that's Carol uh, on her own. 
Next slide, please. And they have uh, uh, written some, uh, uh, some really classic textbooks, uh, uh, Carol and Jerry uh, uh, together, and, uh, uh, and some of them are depicted in, the, uh, uh, in these lower three uh, pictures. And uh, these are a must read for, uh, uh, for pediatric ophthalmology and also for uh, pediatric uh, uh, oncologists. Next slide, please. Some glorious achievements. Um, uh, what I personally find the most impressive is that uh, Carol received the Donders Award in 2003, and I was witness uh, uh, of that. And it was given by the, uh, by the Netherlands Ophthalmic Society. And this is something which happens once in five years. And Carol was the first woman to, uh, uh, to receive this uh, award, and uh, she really deserved it. Uh, she also got the uh, Life Achievement Honor Award from the uh, American uh, Academy. Uh, she uh, is also uh, uh, an uh, Academic All-American Hall of Fame uh, for lifetime success in athletics and in career. So she's also a, a, a really good uh, sportswoman. And uh, she, is, uh, she was uh, a president of the International Society of uh, on uh, Ocular Oncology. Uh, and this is the largest international society of ocular uh, oncology. And of course, they, uh, they uh, choose for the queen of uh, ocular uh, tumors uh, to be their president. Um, Dr. Um, uh, Carol Shields was also uh, list number one in ophthalmology power list and nominated uh, uh, in uh, uh, several uh, years, uh, five uh, cons consecutive years uh, nominated by peers as one of the top 100 leaders of the, uh, of the field in uh, ophthalmology. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Shields is a proponent of early treatment uh, in intraocular melanoma and has been able to save many uh, eyes with this disease in, you would, uh, in uh, using a custom de designed tiny uh, radiotherapy de uh, device to irradiate and resolve intraocular cancer. Other interests uh, include genetic testings of melanoma and retinoblastoma and Dr. Shields' extensive knowledge of cutting edge ocular technology has propelled the oncology service to the forefront of treatment options for patients. So you know where to go to. Next slide. But the most important uh, thing I think is that she, besides her career, because, besides her uh, athletic, be, beside all her publications, she's also the mother of seven wonderful children. Carol, we are very proud that you uh, are uh, the guest of honor in this webinar. Please go ahead and share your knowledge. Hello, my name is Carol Shields. I have no financial interest or relationships to disclose. And I'd like to talk to you about retinoblastoma 2023 from the Ocular Oncology Service at Wills Eye Hospital in Philadelphia, USA. Here are my coworkers. It takes many people to manage one case of retinoblastoma. I always say it takes a village to manage one case of retinoblastoma, and we have been doing this for over 50 years at Wills Eye Hospital. First, let's talk about global retinoblastoma. In British Journal of Ophthalmology, 2009, Cavella wrote a report on the frequency of retinoblastoma, stating that there were 8,000 new cases per year on planet Earth. In 2020, Fabian et al. gathered all cases that were seen in 2017, at least as many as he could gather. He gathered 4,351 new patients with retinoblastoma from 153 countries. And he looked at high income versus low income countries. In high income countries, the median age was 14 months and very few children had extrascleral retinoblastoma or metastasis as compared to low-income countries where the median age was 30 months 
and nearly 50% had extrascleral retinoblastoma and 20% had metastatic disease. Looking at it from a graph standpoint, high versus low income, blue being high income, you can see median age 14 months for high and 30 months for low income countries. And you can see only 2% had extrascleral retinoblastoma in high income countries versus 49% in low income countries. And once again, metastatic disease only 1% in high income versus 19% in low income countries. And I think a lot of this is related to the 16 month difference for tumor detection. Later, Fabian et al. published with numerous co authors, many of them in the audience here. It's coming out in Lancet Global Health 2022, looking at the same cohort of patients and asking the question what is the outcome for children in various countries? So we looked at the same cohort, chemotherapy was available in every country, and he found the three-year survival in high-income countries was 99%, and in mid-high income, 91%. Then it dropped to 80% in mid-low income and only 57% in low-income countries. We have a lot of work to do to help all nations with retinoblastoma detection and care. Now, recently in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, we published a report with our team from Mexico and Kona Lazama from the Mayo Clinic, Dalvin, and from Philadelphia, Will's Eye, myself. And we reviewed modern treatment of retinoblastoma. So let me share with you what we found. It's all about chemotherapy. So we still enucleate the eye with retinoblastoma if there, there is no hope for vision or the child is high risk or the parents are unreliable. We give intravenous chemotherapy for bilateral disease, intraarterial chemotherapy for unilateral disease, and we inject the vitreous or the aqueous if there's seeding. Plaque radiotherapy is still used if all the above fails. A few words about intravenous chemotherapy. It is amazing how successful this has been. We use it to treat one or both eyes, the brain, and systemically reduce second cancers or metastasis. Here we see bilateral retinoblastoma from bilateral massive tumors with total retinal detachment. And after six cycles of intravenous chemotherapy, both eyes show flat retina with regressed tumors, and the child's now 20 years old with 2030 vision right eye and 2070 vision left eye no metastatic disease, but really, does it last for all patients? So we published in BJO 2020, long-term 20-year real-world outcomes of intravenous chemotherapy in nearly 1,000 eyes. Here's what we found. We color-coded each year, one, two, three, five, 10, and 20 years. At one year, patients tend to do well. Group A, B, and C do very well. At two years and three years, it remains stable. At five, 10, and 20 years, it tends to remain stable. So we tell our patients what we see at two and three years is pretty much what the child's going to have long term at 20 years. Now, how often do we need additional IAC or plaque radiation in eyes that receive systemic chemotherapy? Again, IAC in blue, plaque radiation in gr green. We tend to use IAC before plaque radiation and a mean interval of five months versus 13 months. And overall, about 17% of kids who receive intravenous chemotherapy need additional IAC and 19% need plaque radiotherapy. Now a few words about IAC. We use it for unilateral retinoblastoma, especially if we can see some normal retina. Here's a group DI that showed wonderful response just after two doses of IAC. So we published in the Journal of the American Academy of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, 1292 infusions for intraarterial chemotherapy in 341 consecutive eyes. Here's one such eye, a three-year-old boy with advanced group E retinoblastoma, you can see it in A and B, and then after IAC and C and D, 
it's perfectly regressed. So if we look at five-year outcomes for group B retinoblastoma, we have 100% globe salvage, group C 80%, group D 78%, and group E 55% globe salvage. Of course, we do not use IAC for group A retinoblastoma. So overall, globe salvage at five years was 76%, and this is with a median of three infusions and very, very low complication rate. But really, it's not that easy. Our team published in the journal Neurosurgery 2020 how difficult this technique can be. Overall, we had 97% success rate, 3% failure rate, could not access the, the artery. We had an anaphylactic reaction or carotid vasospasm. So I think it's really important to keep in mind that it's not always successful. And the mean number of infusions in that report was three, but some patients got by with two, and some even got by with one infusion for tumor control. The team from Buffalo, New York wrote in a commentary on our article. They said intraarterial chemotherapy has varying efficacy, but it is a medical success story, and it's important to realize that this should be performed at a high volume center where they are well served at a center with expertise that understands how to deliver intraarterial chemotherapy safely. So what about intravitreous chemotherapy? It's used quite a bit in our practice. Here you can see an eye that was filled with vitreous seeds before intravenous chemotherapy. Then after intravenous chemotherapy, we still had seeds left but then we cleaned them up with injection into the vitreous cavity. And there's the macula left. And we published on 192 consecutive injections in which we were successful in 100% of the cases. And then along with our colleagues from New York, we reviewed 10 retinoblastoma centers and found there was no extraocular tumor event or shedding of tumor outside the eye. That's good news. Now, high-risk retinoblastoma, what is high-risk and how do we treat it? Well, let's talk about treatment first. Kaliki et al., when she was in our department, looked at 52 consecutive eyes with high-risk retinoblastoma and found they had high-risk features following a nucleation. And if we treated them with three-agent chemotherapy, vincristin, etoposide, and carboplatin, we were effective in preventing metastatic disease in every case. So we know chemotherapy works for post-enucleation high-risk retinoblastoma. But what exactly is high-risk retinoblastoma? Well, Kaliki recently published in JAMA Ophthalmology a survey from six different continents, Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe, North and South America from 24 different retinoblastoma practices and found that we agree on some definitions of high risk like post-laminar optic nerve invasion or tumor at the optic nerve transection or scleral or extrascleral invasion. And we also agree on massive choroidal invasion, but we don't agree on the anterior segment. If there's tumor in the anterior chamber or the iris or the ciliary body or the trabecular meshwork, some feel it's high risk, some feel it's not high risk. So in Philadelphia, we agree, post-laminar optic nerve invasion is high risk, choroidal invasion of more than three millimeters is high risk, and any combination of optic nerve or choroidal invasion is high risk, and we give adjuvant chemotherapy. Currently, we have a multi-center study underway to evaluate management of high-risk retinoblastoma that will be published next year. So in summary, global uh, retinoblastoma 2023, we discuss global retinoblastoma disparities, high versus low-income countries, chemotherapy for retinoblastoma, and what is and how do we treat high-risk retinoblastoma. It takes a village to manage one case of retinoblastoma, and we all must remain laser focused. Thank you for your attention. 
thank you, Carol. This was a, a wonderful uh, overview uh, of uh, what is happening in the developed world, but also uh, compare it to uh, less uh, developed countries. And I would like to uh, give you uh, uh, the opportunity, uh, having heard uh, the previous four speakers uh, in connection with your talk, um, what is the, um, the red line through all these uh, talks? Please go ahead. Yes, thank you for allowing me to make a few comments. I'm very honored to be here uh, in this retinoblastoma symposium and I have learned a lot today about what is going on in the Philippines and in Guatemala uh, regarding retinoblastoma. Um, I, maybe I'll give a few comments on uh, the talks that we heard before my talk. So going back to the talk by Dr. Gary Mercado, um, he indicated that uh, unilateral retinoblastoma tends to be very advanced group DNA, and that's the same in the US. And in those cases, especially group D, we will use IAC. For group E, maybe 30% of the time we'll use IAC, intraarterial chemotherapy, and 70% of the time we enucleate. To quote Dr. Santosh Hanavar from uh, Hyderabad, India, he has taught me that enucleation is not the end of retinoblastoma, it's the beginning. When an eye is enucleated, you must follow up with your pathologist to see if the eye is high risk, because if it is high risk, optic nerve invasion beyond the lamina, choroidal invasion of more than three millimeters or any combination of optic nerve or choroidal invasion, that patient has a 24% risk for metastatic disease. So those patients, we tend to uh, treat with systemic chemo as I indicated in uh, my talk. And Dr. Mercado also brought up telemedicine and we're using this quite a lot now in our practice, not so much for retinoblastoma, but a lot in the management of melanoma. Um, as we move on, I'd like to make some comments on Dr. Um, Honey Lantio from the Philippines. She made a really nice overview of two cases one that was very reliable and one that was very unreliable. And reliability of the family plays into our treatment. If we detect that the family is unreliable, it's gonna be a nucleation. We don't even talk about chemotherapy because chemotherapy requires the patient to come back for multiple visits. So she indicated reliability is important and I would uh, agree with that. We discussed some of the lower middle income results in my uh, presentation and she indicated the Philippines uh, is classified as a lower middle income uh, country. You know, in, in the Philippines, retinoblastoma is your number one intraocular cancer, but in the US it's not. Our number one intraocular cancer in the US is melanoma. You know, we have maybe 2,500 to 3,000 new cases of uveal melanoma each year and only 300 or 350 cases of retinoblastoma. And another thing that Dr. Teo mentioned was the importance of a team. It's really important to have a good team. You need a pediatric oncologist, a radiation oncologist, an interventional neuroradiologist or neurosurgeon and then you, the ocular oncologist. And, you know, setting up centers can be really difficult, but it's important to have a team because that same team should meet and discuss each case. And that's what we do here. We have Zooms where we meet and discuss each case so that we're all on the same page. Now I'll move on to Dr. Martin. He uh, talked about beautifully all the different treatments of retinoblastoma. He did indicate that uh, plaque radiotherapy is not yet available. And I have to say in the US, we're using plaque less and less for retinoblastoma. It's intravenous chemotherapy, intraarterial chemotherapy. And if a child fails and fails maybe after two really good sessions of chemo, then we'll go on to plaque. 
but plaque causes a lot of problems with radiation, retinopathy, and vitreous hemorrhage. So, you know, eventually you'll have plaque treatment, and we do use it for patients who fail all of the above. He also indicated a, a point that I think is really important. If you're going to put a child on intravenous chemotherapy, you need three agents, vincristin, etoposide, carboplatin, as Dr. Martin said, and you need six months. He said six to nine months. That's fine. Don't be tempted to give it for two months and the patient looks great and you stop it because they're going to get recurrence. You need six months. All the, the big centers that give their results all use at least six months of VEC systemically. He also talked about the consolidation with laser or cryo. Something I learned from one of our fellows who trained at Moorfields, his name is Guy Negretti, he works with Mandeep Sagu. He told me at Moorfields, they may not be doing consolidation as much anymore. And the reason is they've got IAC. So they shrink the tumors with VEC, and if a recurrence happens, then they go on to IAC to cure the eye rather than lasering it. Because every time we do a laser, we're wiping out a big sector of visual field for that child. So something to consider, and it's kind of what we're considering um, here in Philadelphia. Um, he also mentioned intravitreous chemotherapy, and I think that is something really important that you should have in your armamentarium in, um, in the Philippines. We use melphalan or topatican. We tend to use in darkly pigmented children, topatican. Uh, again, we learned, we learned that from Raksha Rao in India. She and Hanavar published that they have far less complication with topatican. And topatican is super safe in the eye. You can go 20 micrograms or 30 micrograms and never see a complication. Whereas with melphalan, 20 micrograms is going to fool you. You'll get good control, but it has a high rate of complications. In very white kids, we tend to use melphalan because the, the complication rate is maybe less than in dark skinned kids. So keep that in mind. Then I'll go over to the talk from Guatemala. Guatemala by Dr. Barnoya and Dr. Amanda. Um, they emphasize the importance of partnerships and teamworks and mentors. And that's what it's all about. I don't know everything about retinoblastoma and I sometimes rely on my fellows or my colleagues. And I think she underscored the importance of learning from others. Um, and she was honest with us. Not every kid has a good outcome. There are some quote, terrible outcomes that we all have to deal with, especially with uh, the very advanced cases. And one other point that uh, she mentioned was the importance of having a psychologist there. And I, I totally agree with that. In the American Journal of Ophthalmology, we published the psychological outcomes of parents in, who have children with retinoblastoma. It's not just the children, even the parents have stress and depression, anxiety. So it's important to not overlook that. So there, there was a lot to learn today. If I would just highlight, if we have a few moments, some important points from my talk, I'll give you maybe five points. Number one, intravenous chemotherapy, in my opinion, is the single best development for retinoblastoma management worldwide. It's available everywhere. It saves eyes, it saves lives. But as I said earlier, you must give six cycles. And know that in order for it to be successful, you sort of have to have IAC available. I congratulate Dr. Martin for having a successful IAC case in the Philippines, and I'm sure you're gonna have many more. That was a tough one to start with because you didn't have the standard, you know, ophthalmic artery off the internal carotid. You had to go to the middle meningeal. And, you know, those are kind of tough cases. 
Um, for, I'll move on to my second point, IAC. We always give three doses, sometimes more. And we only have 76% success. But if a kid fails, what do we do? We do more IAC. We will give them a higher dose. So we usually start with melphalan five milligrams, that's it. But if there's seeds, we'll do five milligrams of melph and one milligram of topotecan. If they fail that, then we go to a higher dose. We go to 7.5 milligrams of melphalan and one or two milligrams of topotecan. We always give them a second round before we call it quits. We talked about high risk retinoblastoma in my presentation. And that's something that I think Dr. Mercado and your team there deal with way more than our team. But of all the eyes that come to a nucleation in Philadelphia, 20% are high risk. So I always tell the patients, the parents, you know, we will do a nucleation, but there's a chance your child's gonna need to be on chemotherapy for six months. We never go less than six months because that's the duration that you're gonna need to deliver the chemo for cure. So I have, uh, I'll, I'll take questions and I have one little surprise for you. I have Dr. Jerry Shields here with me. I already saw him. <laughs> I'm gonna ask him to keep his chin hey, up. Jerry, hello. Hey, hello. hello. Everybody. Hello, hello. Hello, Jerry. Years, he's, he's really taught all of us, right? Gary, Gary of course. You. Andre, Hi, Jerry. You were here. And for all of you, Jason and everybody. For has, everyone. He Hi, Dr. Really Shields. Instrumental and he brought organization to the whole field of ocular oncology. You know, it was before Jerry, it was uh, Dr. Ellsworth. And Dr. Ellsworth mm -hmm. was a huge contributor. Um, and then Jerry took ocular oncology and organized it. He, he gave really good talks and organized everything and passed it on to the rest of us. So it's our job to take it to the next level. So I want to personally thank him. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Jerry. Thank, thank you both. Yeah. So we'll thank take you. questions. Yeah, Carol, uh, one question came uh, through the uh, uh, question and answering uh, 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 box. Uh, what is your opinion of intracameral chemotherapy for anterior segment retinoblastoma? That was one yeah. question of Norman Eric Fajaro. It's, it's an immense ad achievement uh, to give intracameral, that, that is intraaqueous chemotherapy for anterior segment seeds. Um, we don't use melphalan uh, because I just worry about the toxicities of melphalan on the endothelium. And I've listened to Dr. Mounier and with all respect to Dr. Mounier, we prefer topotecan. So we give um, like about 10 micrograms. It's like approximately half the dose that we give into the vitreous, we give into the aqueous and we use a very tiny 32 gauge needle and inject the aqueous. And if we see that there's seeds behind the iris, we'll also inject the posterior chamber. But normally we get it by injecting just the anterior chamber. In this technology technique, we will usually give um, three injections once a month. We've not seen any cataract. We've not seen any corneal decompensation. Topotecan is the nicest of all the chemotherapies that we give. In fact, a really good study from Argentina, Chantada, their team uh, have, has done a lot of research on topotecan, and they just came out with a report that you can give an uh, even higher dose of topotecan, um, at, at least in rabbits, and it doesn't cause toxicities in the eye. I, I foresee in the future, we may be using topotecan even more than we are uh, now. So there's another question for Dr. Shields. Uh, what is your experience of IAC3 drugs for first-time treatment patients? Using IAC3 drugs. So that would be melphalan, topotecan, carboplatin. We used to do that when we started, um, but we had a problem. We, 
And it could have been related to our technique when we started. And I just think about Dr. Martin's case, how he got away with going in the men, middle meningeal and not causing ischemia. But when we started IAC, our first 20 cases, we had eight really bad cases where we had ischemia. So when you first start IAC, know that so much depends on your interventional neuroradiologist or neurosurgeon to not go into the ophthalmic artery. You have to go and look at the ostium and squirt the chemo in, but don't go in. We used to go in the artery a little bit and that caused all those complications. Now we don't see complications, but we blamed it back then on our technique and the carboplatin because carboplatin can be very sclerosing. Uh, to vessels. And that I take that from the brain literature where they use carboplatin for brain tumors. So we tend to use just melphalan and topotecan, but there's nothing wrong with adding carboplatin, 30 or 50 micrograms. Thank you, Carol. I think we have uh, uh, four more minutes. Uh, some comments of the uh, other speakers, starting uh, with the first speaker. Any comments from Dr. Mercado? Uh, unmute your microphone, please. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, Carol and Jerry. Um, yeah, very interesting uh, talks and uh, I appreciate uh, the talk of Dr. Bernoy as well uh, for your strategies and uh, hope we could uh, collaborate as well. I think we're both in the St. Jude uh, group. Nice to see you here. Thank you, Dr. Mercado. Any words from Dr. Theo and Dr. Martin? Uh, yes, I'd just like to thank everyone for uh, organizing this and for inviting me. Uh, I did learn a lot from uh, Dr. Bernoya's uh, session as well as uh, uh, it's always interesting to hear Dr. Shields giving her lecture. Um, so, and, and everyone else, Dr. Mercado and Dr. Martin as well. So uh, thank you very much for, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Same, I'm glad to be here, still learning a lot from you, Cairo, and hope to impart RB um, worldwide, and hopefully we catch up to the developed countries. Uh, Margarita Barnoya, what is your last comment? Yes, thank you all for great presentations. I've learned a lot today. It's always so interesting, and I kept writing and taking notes about Carol's presentation. I always learn a lot from her and it's so nice to see you, Dr. Shields. Thank you all for a great morning session. Okay, last question to uh, Carol and Jerry. Um, is one of your children uh, becoming an ophthalmologist? Um, <laughs> guess what? So Jerry and I had seven children. Yeah. Number one became a psychiatrist to a psychiatrist. Number three, uh, became an attorney for a radiologist. We were waiting and waiting. Um, uh, no, for a um, orthopedic surgeon, five a radiologist, and number six who is on this webinar is going Whoa. into ophthalmology. So oh, we're lovely. very happy. Her name is Charlotte Nelly. She's on this webinar. She's probably very embarrassed right now, but <laughs> we'd like to. <laughs> go into yeah. the field of ophthalmology and we hope we get her into ocular oncology to yeah, care she better <laughs> she better be because uh, having a mom and dad like that uh, that's uh, that's a legacy and uh, she can pick up uh, the red tape and or the red thread and uh, serve the world uh, like mom and dad did and thank you very much for this excellent uh, uh, presentation and all the good work, uh, publications, et cetera, et cetera. You, uh, the uh, king and queen of ocular uh, oncology. Thank you very much. Thank you all and congratulations on all your successes. Farouk, would you like to close the, uh, the uh, session, please? Um, uh, I think oh, Sati has a question. Oh, sorry, Sati. Sati, Sati, Sati you ahead. have a question from the audience? Unmute your micro. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Yes. We uh, have a, a question for Dr. Shields. Uh, could you please repeat what, um, 
Uh, ba -ba 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 um, one minute it was could um could you please uh, repeat what to do if um yeah, intracolor uh, fails after the first three cycles so uh the question was what to do if iac fails Fails. yes yes first yes. cycle three cycle yes mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we give IAC, we usually, if there's no vitreous seeds, we'll start out just with melphalan. And we start with usually melphalan five milligrams times three months. If there are vitreous seeds, extensive vitreous seeds or extensive subretinal seeds, we'll use melphalan and topotecan. Melphalan five milligrams, topotecan one milligram. And give it for three or four cycles, depending upon how advanced it is. If that fails, we go on to a second round of intraarterial chemotherapy and we just bump up the dose of melphalan to 7.5 milligrams and topotecan often will keep it the same or we'll bump it up to two milligrams. So if we fail, we'll go to melphalan 7.5 milligrams, topotecan one or two milligrams and use it for another three or four cycles. If we fail and we only have vitreous seeds, well, then we'll inject the vitreous with chemotherapy. Thank you so much, Dr. Shields. One more time, Carol and Jerry. Great to, great to see you. Great to have you. Actually, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Ten um, as the, the, uh, the local host and to end the session and, and then hand it over to, to Dr. Yam for, for the next webinar announcement. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Farouk. So again, uh, the Pediatric uh, the Philippine Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus would like to thank the IPOSC and the AEO for allowing us to co-host this particular uh, event. Um, do we have announcements for the next uh, webinar, Sati? Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. I will um, show my... Um, so... Um, I want to um, uh, say that uh, uh, IPOS will have the next webinar on June 19 with the association, um, uh, Strabismological Association of Italy. Um, and uh, the topic will be hot topics in strabismology. Uh, moderators will be Joseph Demer from uh, USA and um, uh, also, um, Andrea Piantanida from Italy. Uh, there will be uh, speakers from different countries uh, from Italy, Giovanni Marcon, Michelle Frezina, and Anna Dickman. And uh, there will be Joseph Demer from USA, Nikos Kozes from Greece, and Victoria Balasanyan from Russia. So uh, join us. It will be a very interesting webinar on June 19. With thank that, you. thank you all for, for joining us again one more time, and uh, we conclude the session. Uh, have a yeah. great, great weekend. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Carol thank and you. Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, yeah. everybody, and hope to thank see you, you. Uh, soon in person. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.